This video was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Hello, I'm Corey Osted, and I'm an epidemiologist with a team that designs and conducts real world studies. I'm here today to talk about common defects found with boroscopes. New standards say that endoscopes should be inspected with lighted magnification every time they're used. And we agree because there have been way too many cases of patients who got infections or injuries when endoscopes that were damaged or dirty were used for their procedures. In my view, using a boroscope to inspect the inside of channels and ports aligns with these guidelines because boroscopes provide lighting and magnification that helps you see what's going on inside there. To make sure we're on the same page about this, boroscopes are just tiny endoscopes that are used to scope the scope or look inside lumens or in nooks and crannies of instruments where you can't see what's going on by looking at the outside. My team has used boroscopes to inspect hundreds of endoscopes, and we've found defects inside almost every scope we've inspected. Now we've heard from a lot of frontline personnel that they don't know how to get started. They don't know how to use a boroscope, what to look for, or how to interpret what they see when they do the inspections. So this video is gonna provide you a bunch of examples of defects we've seen when we've been in the field. And all of the scopes shown in this video were considered by the institution to be patient ready because they were fully processed and ready to go for the next procedure. We're gonna start by looking at a few photos of fluid retained inside the ports and channels of endoscopes that we found in storage cabinets, which is concerning because moisture fosters the growth of molds, and fungi and other bad germs that could harm patients. Now this picture shows a puddle of fluid inside the air water valve housings of a colonoscope. And it looked like the stainless steel was kind of banged up too with some scratches. So we compared it to photos we had of a brand new colonoscope, which is completely dry and didn't have any scratches. We don't know if the scratches are considered normal wear and tear or if they require repair. And that's a question for the manufacturer or repair company. Now this gastroscope had two little rows of fluid droplets that extended for quite a ways in the channel, right here. Our team calls these tidy little rows of droplets strings of pearls to distinguish them from individual droplets or droplets that are scattered randomly throughout the channel. Now this scope had been hanging in the channel for three days before we inspected it, so the germs had a long time to bask in a moist environment. Now this colonoscope had retained fluid going halfway across the channel, right here. And there are several scratches there that have become somewhat discolored, possibly from soil or bio burden that wasn't completely removed from the scope and the scratch surfaces. So it's both moist and dirty. Now let's take a look at this video where we saw something that appeared to be moving and it looked kind of like it was alive and had eyes and a heartbeat. Can you see that thing wiggling? We were gasping and laughing and trying to figure out what it was. And then when we got closer and backed up, we realized that it was fluid that had stretched all the way across the channel in a way that looked kind of like a sheet of saran wrap or cellophane. Now the two lights are reflections from the light guides in the boroscope. And once we got a close look at it, we realized that the fluid went all the way across the channel. And when we attempted to go through it with our boroscope, the fluid got the boroscope uh, dirty or wet and it made the image blurry. So we had to withdraw the boroscope, clean it and dry it before we could continue on with our exam. Now this gastroscope had a lot of droplets but the fluid was kind of milky and cloudy, not clear, and it was flattened out along the surface, which seemed kind of odd. Once we noticed this thick, milky fluid, we began to see it throughout the ports and channels of numerous endoscopes. Notice how shimmery it is. This was clearly not just rinse water or alcohol used for final flushes, and we wondered what it could be. So we asked the GI nurses in this ambulatory surgery center to take a look at the photos. And they said it looked kind of like the infant gas relief drops that their physicians use to reduce foaming and bubbling that interferes with their ability to see when they're doing procedures. They pulled out bottles of the gas relief drops they used 
and we saw that it was a white fluid that was cloudy and shimmery and thick, kind of like molasses or maple syrup. Now the label said the active ingredient was cymethicone, which is a kind of silicone. So I put a few droplets on my fingertips and it was super slippery. In fact, it, it kind of felt like oil. Now, the GI nurses mentioned that it's not always white. In fact, sometimes it's pink like this. Now, happily, we were able to capture samples of the thick fluid that was inside the scopes, and we sent them to a chemistry lab along with bottles of the infant gas relief drops like this. And they did lab tests and confirmed that the fluid we found inside scopes was indeed cymethicone which doesn't dissolve in water or detergent, and therefore it can't be washed away by our usual cleaning solutions. Now let's look at a mysterious blob we found inside an EUS scope. Now that's a GI endoscope that has an ultrasound component on the end. Can you see this swirly three-dimensional mass that's stuck to the channel right here? We thought it looked kind of like a saucer of ice cream cone or a little brontosaurus and we gently poked it with a boroscope, and then we tried poking it with a channel brush, but we couldn't remove it or even get it to budge. And it seemed to be hard as a rock. So we showed it to technicians, and they said it was tissue glue, which they said physicians use to stop bleeding or seal up wounds during endoscopy. The problem is that's kind of like super glue, and it sticks and hardens to anything it comes in contact with immediately like patient tissue or the scope. So now this is a glob of red stuff we found inside a colonoscope. We thought it was possibly mucus or a thick fluid like cymethicone, and we tried to remove it with a swab for lab testing. But unfortunately it had hardened and it was firmly adhered to the surface and we couldn't get it out with a swab. So the techs tried soaking it and scrubbing it with cleaning brushes, but they couldn't get it off. So they ran it through the AER. And as you can see here, the appearance changed then, and the glob became kind of lighter pink and more opaque as it hydrated. So the techs ran it through cleaning cycles and HLD cycles in the AER a couple of times, and we looked at it again, but it was still there. And one of the GI docs decided to see if he could try to get it out using boroscope guided instruments. So he started by using a brush, which as you can see here, makes fairly good contact with the channel, but it didn't work to get the chunk out and it was still there. So he went after it with a forceps. All right, let's take a look at what happened. He was eventually able to grab it and tug it out. Now, although that's great, this is a bit concerning because it could have come off in a patient during a procedure if we hadn't happened to see it with the boroscope and worked with the techs and the GI doc to make sure the debris was removed before use. Now this gastroscope had red streaks all along the left side of the channel and thick white fluid coating the surface with droplets and globs everywhere. Kind of sound familiar? Well, we don't know for sure what it is, but tests for organic soil and microbes came back positive, and so the scope was sent out for repair. Now we have seen discoloration that's brighter red, like this example from a pediatric colonoscope. Do you see that red blotch on the left side of the picture? Now, bloody residue tends to be kind of brown or black, not bright red like this. And we've seen similar bright red spots inside ureteroscopes and bronchoscopes. We initially weren't sure what to make of it, but then Olympus released a, a document saying that they mark their channels with red or black ink or dye. We've also heard that replacement channels are cut from large spools of channel material, and sometimes there's a colorful marking just inside the channel near the end, so Tex will know when it's running out. In any case, although this red stuff looks really alarming, it might be just fine and we recommend you reach out to your manufacturer or repair company if you find puzzling things like this during your boroscope exams. Now here's an example of rusty brown discoloration inside the biopsy port of a bronchoscope channel, right here. 
We don't know whether that's organic soil or biofilm or a defect in the stainless steel surface that's become rusty. We've seen large patches of this rusty brown discoloration like this inside numerous, uh, numerous endoscopes. And generally, we recommend that techs try to clean it off and then send it out for assessment and repair if it can't be removed by additional cleaning. Now, this colonoscope channel had a lot of nasty brown stuff in the distal end the first time we looked at it. And I don't really love thinking about what that might be. And here's how it looked two months later. Notice how similar the photos look? The patterns in the brown stuff are the same, even though it had been used and reprocessed about once a day for a couple of months. The biggest changes really are that there are a few new brown scratches in the photo at the right, which is two months after the baseline. Now this is a channel of another scope found in the same GI department, and it looked pretty similar with brown stuff all around the distal end. But something happened at this institution. Uh, they got new AERs that had a cleaning cycle, and they switched from glutaraldehyde for HLD to parasitic acid. Two weeks later, we took a look at this scope, and it looked like this. And as you can see, most of that brown stuff was gone. A couple of months later, it was totally gone. We don't know if it disappeared due to the extra cleaning in the new AER, or if parasitic acid made a difference in getting the brown stuff off. But you can tell that the brown stuff went away and therefore it tells you that it was some kind of residue, soil or biofilm, that should have been getting cleaned out every time. So this is the distal end of one more pediatric colonoscope. And in this case, you can see that there was brown stuff on the outside of the scope too, and also on the inside. And that's gross. But I'm showing this uh, one to you because it had some other interesting things. Like there's some scratches down here and there's fuzzy channel lining right here. So that scope's also damaged, it's dirty and damaged. Now, do you remember the scope that had the fluid all the way across the channel? That's the same scope. And it also had deep scratches like this one that was 10 centimeters inside the biopsy port area. And this scratch, which was five centimeters from the distal end of the scope. And they're filled with brown stuff. We suspect that that's soil or biofilm. And it's especially concerning because there was a lot of fluid in the channel, which can harbor the growth of germs in there. Now, when we first saw this defect, we thought it was a piece of retained tissue stuck to the channel wall, along with some organic brown soil. And we called it filamentous debris. We thought the shape of this was kind of funny because it looked like a tall boot that was in the shape of Italy. Now the GI docs we were working with wanted to remove it for lab tests and he tried to knock it free using a channel brush, but it didn't work. So he decided to try to grab it with a snare he uses during procedures. So to assist him, we inserted a boroscope in the distal end of the colonoscope and he inserted the guide for the snare through the instrument port. Then he slowly approached the debris and tried to grab it with the snare. That's when we noticed that there were multiple pieces of debris hanging into the channel, and we saw that it was discolored brown wherever this debris was present. He made multiple attempts to grab it before we realized that it was firmly attached to the channel wall. And ultimately, he was able to remove a sample of it using a biopsy forceps and we sent it to a lab that used electron, micros electron microscopy uh, to find out what it was, and it was the lining of the channel. So as you can see, wherever the channel lining is torn up, there's brown buildup on the surface, and we believe that's soil and biofilm. Okay, we've also found long strands of filamentous debris inside every kind of endoscope, like these bronchoscopes and GI scopes. I think it's actually kind of pretty and it looks a little bit like seaweed flapping around, but fragments of channel lining like this could interfere with her processing effectiveness for sure, or worse, they could get entangled with instruments or become detached when a doctor is passing an instrument through the channel and get pushed into the patient's body.
By the way, we've also seen this filamentous debris in your reader-scope channels, but the pictures look different um, because we had to use a 0.8 millimeter fiber optic borescope to get inside of these uh, tiny little channels. And, uh, and so that tells us that it's happening in all kinds of channels, and other researchers refer to this as channel shredding. We don't know the clinical significance of this, uh, shredding and filamentous debris, but we think uh, any channels that look like this should get sent out for repair. Now we recently observed some tiny white flecks of debris inside a bunch of scopes in a hospital GI department. And we could see them even in the channel from the outside of the distal end. Now the endo manager and their nurses thought it might be lint from the towels that they use to dry the scopes, even though they're supposed to be lint-free towels. And then we had an idea about how to find out if that was true. So they had a Tecra process the scope and blow it dry. And then we inserted a boroscope into the channel and confirmed that most of the little particles were gone. Then we positioned it just inside the distal end of the scope while they used a towel to dry the outside of the scope. And you can see what happened. Each swipe of the towel deposited more lint inside the distal end of the scope. You can see the fibers building up every time the towel takes a pass at it. And this towel was supposed to be lint free. Anyway, this is super bad because bronchoscopes are used in patients' lungs and lint and other debris like this could come out when the doctor passes an instrument through the scope or uses water or sterile saline to flush things out. In any case, the facility stopped using the towels they had been using and switched to something that was truly lint-free. Okay, just a couple more things. Our team has also spotted other types of debris inside endoscopes. And this photo shows a piece of metallic debris found inside a colonoscope near the biopsy port right here. It looked kind of like a little robot or IFU and a GI doc told us that he thought it was a hinge from a hemostasis clip, which is used to stop bleeding during procedures. And this is an example of a bronchoscope channel that's dented. Now, sometimes when you see dents like this, you can see on the outside of the insertion tube that it's kind of squashed, but other times you can't see anything from the outside. That would indicate you've got a defective channel like this. When we showed this photo to the pulmonologist at the hospital where we found this, they said, uh, aha, they had one of these aha moments because it explained why it's so difficult to pass instruments down the channel of some scopes. They get kind of hung up and they said, oh my goodness, it's actually squashed. So in any way, uh, this scope obviously needs to be sent for repair. So let's wrap up with some key points. When you begin using a boroscope to inspect your endoscopes, you're probably going to find some with retained fluid, which may or may not be water or alcohol used for flushing, foreign substances or debris, including lint and fragments of accessories or brushes, soil and biofilm, and damage, including dense and shredded channels. And when you see something odd, you might have to do some detective work to figure out what it is. So we recommend you go visiting and partner with other stakeholders to investigate. In any case, we recommend that you have a plan in place to deal with whatever you observe before you start, because you might have to re-clean, re-dry, repair, or report issues to other stakeholders when you do your boroscope exams. This video is an excerpt from a free hour-long CE webinar on visual inspection of flexible endoscopes with boroscopes. And you can learn more about visual inspection by watching our CE webinars on the topic. You can also watch our YouTube videos on endoscope anatomy, common defects on scope exteriors, and tools for visual inspection. If your stakeholders want to see published evidence about the value of boroscopes, we've written a few papers about the topic, and citations and links for these resources are in the description posted in YouTube. Thanks for watching this video. For more information, visit our website or contact us by email at education at austedinsights.com. This video was made possible by an educational grant from Healthmark, which provided the boroscopes we used to take most of the photos and videos shown in this program. Please contact Healthmark directly for further information about their systems for visual inspection at www.hmark.com.
This is a list of disclaimers you should review and consider prior to making any changes to device processing or visual inspection practices at your facilities.